This is the kind of video I don't think any other channel does without a script or without extensive editing, but I'm going to try to do this freestyle. The moral of the story, hashtag spoilers, is that peer review is not what people think it is. I got my best girl here, Melissa, off camera, so I'm talking to her in as much as I'm talking to the camera to keep this spontaneous, keep this off script, keep keep this, let's let's keep this train in a constant state of, of derailment, okay? <laughs> there's there's a hilarious example I'm going to edit in a clip of this here of uh, a study that was published in multiple respected peer review journals that took the completely science fiction concept of having magical superpowers in the Star Wars movies and published it as as peer reviewed science in 2017 a paper was written about midi chlorians a made-up microscopic life form from the Star Wars franchise. The paper was a mashup of a Wikipedia article on the mitochondria with Star Wars fiction, even including the monologue about Darth Plagueis the Wise from Revenge of the Sith. This article was published by four journals, the American Journal of Medical and Biological Research, the International Journal of Molecular Biology Open Access, the Austin Journal of Pharmacology and Therapeutics, and the American Research Journal of Biosciences. Would anyone use this as proof that molecular biology is a fraud? That biologists are corrupt? Yeah, <laughs> so they use like the technical made-up terms that are in the Star Wars movies for how people... Yeah, you know in the, the movies they get these magical superpowers? There's some jargon for that in their, their science fiction universe. Now, I think this was, of course, partly to, to prove the extent to which academic peer review is flawed, even in the hard sciences. But I think this example was chosen because any one of those key terms, if a person doing the peer review just thought, oh, I don't really know what that term means, and Googled it, a Google search would immediately direct them to like a Star Wars fan page, right? So this is like the, you know, the worst way to kind of lampoon, you know, the system. But my point in this video is not that peer review is a good system and that the system is broken, but that people fundamentally misunderstand what peer review is. So whether it's good or bad, I think by the end of this video, you'll, you'll have a sense. It's not what you think it is. Now, all right, so Melissa, you probably grew up with some praise of the scientific method. This this is a real difference in people's upbringings in, in the school system. Oh yeah. Like so, did you did you learn the scientific method as like the guiding light of Western yeah. civilization? Okay. Definitely. Well, yeah. I, I I really didn't get the much. So what? Like okay. Off the top of your head, what is the scientific method? What? Why does it matter? Was this? Well, what was the ideology? Or what was the ideal of the scientific method that you? you know, you grew up with. To come to a conclusion, you have to make an experiment. And in this experiment, you have to propose a hypothesis and test the hypothesis. She has a sharp memory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to come up with yeah. an experiment to test the hypothesis. Right. And um, right. you have to kind of control for different variables and make right. sure that you right. know, uh, there aren't corrupting factors from one end or another right. and do this test and ultimately you should do it multiple times to get different results right. uh, and do it with different variables. And, and like then, for you, in terms of like romanticizing this for kids or making, giving it life in the classroom, were you given examples like, I mean, sorry, I'm thinking of examples I learned much later in life. There was a famous example of a scientist in England who discovered that cholera was being spread by a, by a public well or something. Well, I, or maybe it was just Isaac Newton and the apple and the discovery of gravity or something. I mean, was there something given to you to, to say like, hey, this was the difference between the dark ages when people, you know, <laughs> you know, people didn't know to wash their hands with soap and water in the emergency. Were, were you given some kind of set of examples, or does um, nothing stick in your memory? I'm sure I was given examples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, they aren't coming to mind, but you know, yeah. you just, yeah, mentioned, yeah, 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 you just yeah. mentioned soap, right? Using soap. And yeah, 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 I, yeah. I remember learning about that. Like, um, so uh, my for my generation, this stuff was different because partly because I had a terrible education in Canada, but partly because the, the dark cloud of the atom bomb was really hanging over Western culture. And when you grow up, that was that had really dissipated. Like, what is science and what is the scientific method? Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, the atom bomb and even the Holocaust itself, you know, because the, the Holocaust, you know, it, it wasn't just mass murder. It was technologically sophisticated factory production, you know, applied to mass murder. And, and you know, yeah. gas chambers, this was a new technology. Um, you know, I just say the, the image of the progress of science and technology. And also, sorry, just, just keeping it all the way real, the link between Nazi experiments and vivisection in our own culture and the push at that time to try to end testing of uh, cosmetics on rabbits. Those things added up. This is long before I'd heard of veganism or became vegan. That, that added up to give science a, a really menacing quality. So I think that that really, for my generation, I was at the end of that period of time, because after about 1989, 1991, all that stuff about the atom bomb starts to disappear. And indeed, the memory of the Holocaust in World War II is increasingly kind of put in a locker. Yeah. It's not the, you know, because for me, my, my grandparents were still alive. That generation was still around. Um, so the, the, the ideology of scientific progress, I think, starts to change with the end of the Cold War. Hmm. Um, yeah. But it was well, one, I, of, I, one of I guess that wasn't influencing my right. opinion on science. Right. Like you know. But you you grew up with more of a straightforward positive view yeah, of scientific even, method like, and yeah. Even when I was a kid, progress like, I civilization. It was a project when uh, I, I would believe I was in elementary school where right. we actually went to the top the roof of my school and we dropped eggs that were encapsulated in uh, various. Um, contraptions to see if the egg would crack or not right and um you know what what was more effective like what padding was more effective than others this is like re, re reenacting galileo's experiments yeah, with the yes. orange and stuff yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and yeah. yeah science like uh chemistry experiments too right. like you know there are some some experiments well i think i think this is part of you know the very definition of modernity mm -hmm. is the idea that civilization is scientific progress as opposed to the idea that civilization is tradition, you know, which may well include mm -hmm. religion, that, you know, tradition, legends, common, you know, common fables, that the, the, the fabric of folkways, that's a bit of a technical term, but still it's complete, if you've never heard the term folkways, you never let us know exactly what it means, to you. that, you know, it's not folk culture, folklore, or tradition, but it's, it's scientific progress is, is the very stuff of, of civilization itself. And as I say, from my generation, that, that took a hit. I think this this is the illusion that people project onto peer review. So, like, what is the difference between people dying of cholera and people having, you know, modern hygiene? Now, again, I think what we're actually taught in school is that the difference is the scientific method, that we discovered the necessity of sewage treatment and that we had to reorganize our cities and stop drinking river water that had our own poo in it. So it wasn't huge that for civilization. You know, we learned the hard way. I mean, sorry, I don't know if you know, that's another famous example. You know, doctors would handle sick people and corpses. Yes, and then babies. And right, babies right. Were... And they would transmit the disease. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's even during the, the early life of Sigmund Freud, those basic concepts about transmission of disease were still not properly understood. Sorry, I read a biography of Sigmund Freud that dealt with some of that stuff. Um, in Vienna, you know, the, the, what were then the breaking discoveries when he was coming up as, as a student and uh, changing attitudes towards, towards medical science and progress. Um, but that's not what peer review is. That's not what peer review is at all neither in its function nor in its dysfunction. So this is it. Unlike this funny example of the Star Wars uh, pseudoscience getting in, there's another example I can put up, uh, 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 you know, where, where an author, a scientist, I suppose, as a joke, wrote a hilariously awful article, which is kind of a lampoon on postmodern jargon, and managed to get that uh, published, even though it was completely meaningless and this kind of thing. Uh, whether it's in the pure sciences or the social sciences, I'm not here so much concerned with the, the dysfunction as the real function and limits of peer review. So my perspective on this is partly as someone who cares passionately about politics. And I mean, this comes up even when you discuss something like Wikipedia. How can you possibly expect Wikipedia to have new, politically neutral information or for their, their editorial process to work? No, I, I'm not saying Wikipedia is the worst. Probably Wikipedia is better than most newspapers in terms of giving you a somewhat balanced uh, you know, variety of sources. But whenever you get into anything that's really politically dicey, um, you know, and you, you, whenever you get to a, a Wikipedia article and has a little lock symbol in the corner, you know there are people who passionately care about this issue 
There are people who are willing to tell lies, people who are willing to back up their lies, and they may well have sources in print. So I mean, most extreme and easy case is something like Holocaust denial. They have sources they can cite. Of course, those sources are dishonest and bad and wrong. But I mean, you know, you could have an endless series of revision wars, of editorial struggles at Wikipedia for how you're going to write, you know, the history of the Holocaust. So how can how can Wikipedia work? Now, by the same token, so I've, I've been involved in politics basically all my life. I had a period of about ten years where I was a scholar of Buddhism. Now, in case you're new to the channel. I was a, a very edgy, <laughs> you know, I, was, I was a scholar of Buddhism who was interested in social and political problems. So I didn't turn off my brain within Buddhism. I was genuinely interested in, for example, the history of slavery, um, you know, the plight of the poor and, and all kinds of uh, political and economic issues, you know, past and present. But I was nevertheless a canonical Theravada Buddhist scholar. How do you expect a peer review committee in Japan that may be primarily staffed by Buddhist monks to have a, a... What does peer review mean when the people reviewing your paper are Japanese Buddhist monks in a conservative Buddhist university? Or even, it may literally be located in a monastery where they have this, this meeting, right? If that's a little bit too exotic for you, you can change it to a group of Catholic priests. And you present them with an essay. You're like, hey, I wrote an essay about the history of, uh, of slavery and how the Catholic Church was involved in it and all the terrible things you guys did and, and how the priests were involved and they would torture people and the priests would interrogate them. Yeah, I did all this historical research about how terrible you guys were. Now look, I have not been involved in journals of, of Catholic studies. I think there probably are some journals of Catholic studies where, where you know the editors, even though they're, they're true believing Catholics, may really be people of, of merit and integrity and may say, hey, this is an important part of our, our history to, to publish. But I've got to tell you something. It's not my experience with Buddhism. It's not, right? It's really not. And uh, not to get too deep into this, but I made an earlier video of myself talking to a professor, a current professor of Buddhist studies, where I was still proposing that I go back and get a PhD in Buddhism. That door is still open to me. I really do have enough background to very easily get a, get a PhD in that field, which would change my whole life from this point out, if I deign to do so. Um, and one of the points at which he suddenly got very defensive was where I simply talked about bias within the field. And I backed that up. I, you know, I don't mean racism necessarily in a conventional lowbrow sense. And what I said to him then, also, even though it was spur of the moment, I said, you know, I think quite convincingly and quite clearly, I said, if you're talking to someone who's devoted their life to Japanese Buddhism, what is their attitude towards a paper about Sri Lankan Buddhism or Buddhism in Cambodia? I mean, the geographic and linguistic divisions here. Tibet is unimaginably far in both far away both in language and culture and history and politics. It's a whole different set of questions from Sri Lanka and Thailand. Okay? So you know, but that those are exactly the forms of editorial bias. But my point here is peer review doesn't work either way. Peer review doesn't work if I'm a specialist within Tibetan Buddhism and all the reviewers are pious, true believing Tibetan monks, and it doesn't work if it's someone from Tibet submitting their paper to a group of reviewers who are all Japanese Buddhist monks. It utterly breaks down and breaks apart. Sorry, it's not even that it breaks, this is how it works. This is what peer review really is. It's a conclave of true believers giving their imprimatur to studies that agree with their latent biases and their political and ideological agendas. So this has come up in debates about global warming and anti-global warming. So you've got 10 academics with PhDs who do peer review for a publication. They may be sincerely, okay, let's, let's just say we started a publication. We had 10 professors who were all specifically passionate about uh, endangered species conservation. Okay, that's really their background. And then over time, because global warming is the big issue, they start peer reviewing papers on global warming. They, they probably don't have the same way the Japanese scholar, I mean, what expertise is he going to have relevant to my paper about slavery? Probably none. Even though it's a subtle shift, this guy's an expert in, in endangered species conservation. All he sees is, well, this is a study with a lot of complex math in it, uh, and it's supporting a global warming hypothesis. Again, he is not paid to take the time and go through those numbers in detail. Believe me, if I, if I write a, a, a paper for Buddhism and I'm quoting the original Pali, 
I'm dealing with complex linguistic and historical. Nobody. No, I'm going to come back to this. It's also part of part of the reality of peer review versus editing. Peer review is not editing. It's not the same thing. In terms of making an in-depth edit and evaluation and going through and checking your math or checking your argument, no, 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 that's not going to happen. Whether you have 10 scholars who are sincere, uh, sincere about wanting to ring the alarm bells on global warming, they're going to sit there and say, oh, okay, good. Like, this is on our side. It seems to me it looks, the data looks like data. Not going to evaluate it rubber stamp imprimatur it gets published and then the opposite is what you also see there's going to be some publication and they have managed to get 10 scientists who are against global warming and they're rubber stamping publications that, that come the other way and within buddhism i think that the saddest and sickest example of this which i've dealt with in several videos on this channel is the science the complete bullshit masquerading as as real science of, of publishing peer-reviewed scientific papers about uh meditation and the, the stuff is just as fake as in the old days when Christians used to publish uh, peer-reviewed studies trying to prove that prayer was effective, that prayer was effective in healing people who were in a coma, or that prayer had some impact on a, on a plant that was a real, that was published in all the newspapers. They did a study where, you know, like, they had one set of potted plants over here that nobody prayed to, and they had another set where they had true-believing Christians come in and pray to the plant and see which plants grew better. It's like... <laughs> I remember laughing with a friend of mine. I was like, even if this is true, like, like, <laughs> why do you worship this God that you think makes a 5% difference in how rapidly, uh, you know, a daisy grows out of a pot or something? Wow. So, you know, that, that kind of junk science has always been around. And this is, this is not peer review failing to work. This is how peer review actually works. So one of my perspectives on this is because I used to work as a professional editor of academic nonfiction. And I was offered that job again in Taiwan. My whole life would be different if I'd taken it. But, and I, I had authors from all over the world, you know, mostly white Europeans, but also some Asians. I had quite a number of Japanese authors, uh, maybe one from Thailand, one from Indonesia. But you know, they were mostly white Westerners. But even then, you saw a really deep culture. Like the difference between a German academic and a French academic and an American academic, it's remarkable. And I deal with all these people at PhDs. They'd be sending me their manuscripts or their book chapters, and I'd be making the book. But I'd be going through and really editing. And one of the things I have to get across to them is, no, 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 no. Editing is not peer review. They were used to peer review, which is what I described before, right? And the peer reviewer isn't paid a salary. And the peer reviewer doesn't correct grammatical error. I mean, they, they may, I mean, you know, if, if, they, if they go through it in detail. A peer reviewer is not going through, and like, this is the type of error I would catch all the time. You have the date 1763 in your essay, and I just take the time to look it up. Oh, no, 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 you meant 1673. All the time, those errors are in there. I, I, I'm an editor, I'm not a peer reviewer. I stop and I challenge you. Okay, well, you said this about the government policy at this time, but in this section of the essay, you said this instead. There's a... That's editing. And the editor's role has withered up and died because basically the, the publishing industry no longer has the, the money for it and nobody's willing to pay for it. And you have to pay a, a, an erudite, hardworking person with attention to detail to do it. Sorry, and I just want to make this clear. Uh, editing is also not copy editing, right? Copy editing is a separate word that's sometimes referred to as sub-editing. Copy editing is where you just check for spelling errors and commas in the wrong place and you know formatting errors and hyphens, this kind of stuff. Real editing, real editorial, is where you actually challenge the audience. Okay, you said this here, there's no footnote. How do you know that? How do you back it up? I remember one guy got furious with me because I just pointed out that he presented. I said, look, you present an interesting argument here, but you don't have any footnotes or context explaining it. I don't know to what extent this is your original work or if this is something that's appeared in five other books before I need to. He, he was furious. He called down, he, he calmed down eventually, but we had several emails back and forth trying to iron this out. I was like, look, if we're going to publish this, you know, you can't claim to be inventing the wheel with research that's not really your research and, and this sort of thing. So this is, this is another of the misconceptions. Now, one of the things people said about me back when I was a scholar of Buddhism, I'd never seen this word before. They said, oh, that Eisel Mazard, he's an originist. <laughs> he, he analyzes things by looking at their origins, which is, it was interesting comment about me. Okay, um, what is the origin of peer review? I have brought this up with many, many professors. I had a very brief story about it on my old blog. Um, and every single time, professors were astounded to learn this. Okay, Peer review originated in the United Kingdom. 
I would just say England, Scotland, and Wales. But it really especially has to do with Scotland. This came up a lot when we were living in China. I was explaining to my students that the real turning point in the history of education in Europe actually took place in Scotland, not England. And then England caught up, you know, several generations later. But Scotland started having these learned societies in places like Edinburgh and Glasgow. They started with a, they were making remarkable scientific progress and discoveries, also um, the medical school in Edinburgh and so on. But of course, also in other fields, even like sociology, you know, stuff that's more uh, social sciences or what have you, they were doing and publishing a lot of original research. And up to that point, they had ye olde censor's office. In England, there still is the office of the censor. There is still one man in England who has the title censor. It's an official government post there. It's not just, we just complain about censorship as an abstract concept. That's actually a job still today in, uh, in the government of England to be the censor. He's one man. And this one man, you know, I assume has a few secretaries and, and assistants, what have you, could not oversee these scientific publications. And a couple centuries earlier, in the Dark Ages, you could, you know. And that was a job. So this is also linked to the different, the split between Protestantism and Catholicism in Europe. Because before, you know, when England was, was Catholic, before Henry VIII and, and split away, that job was, was really handled by Rome. And for many parts of Europe, it, it continued to be. So when Copernicus uh, started, well, sorry, it's really in one publication from Copernicus. But he wrote this one important work, and he published it only in Latin not in any vernacular, which I think he knew that was to avoid censorship. Um, it was handed over. Uh, ultimately, it was, it was the Vatican. It was the, the Catholic authorities in Rome who would decide whether or not to suppress it. And an historian went in and did the, uh, did the detailed analysis. It would have been censored, but apparently the, the, one, the reviewer who mattered the viewer who was ringing alarm bells, because you had to read the Latin carefully. It was a lot of math. I mean, it had to do with observations of the movements of the stars and planets and explaining this thesis. You had to be really good at both Latin and math to figure out how subversive this work from Copernicus was. But the one guy who figured it out in Rome, he died. He died of natural causes at the right time. So the book wasn't censored. So, yeah, so I just say that the censor's role, one, Protestantism cuts you off from the Catholic tradition of censorship. And sorry, and again, that, that battle then gets fought generations later by Galileo. Galileo is the martyr for modern science in that way in his own peculiar uh, historical character, right? So in England, this becomes England's own responsibility, Scotland's own responsibility. And they don't want to do it. So they set up a system of decentralized censorship. And that is the origin of peer review. The role of the peer reviewer at its inception and still today was simply to review the work and rubber stamp it that there was nothing objectionable to the government. It was taking, it was developed very literally as taking the role of censorship and farming it out to established scholars. You say, okay, well, you're a member of the establishment. You're already a professor or something. You're some kind of respectable scientist. You know the kind of thing the government wouldn't allow to be published or that we'd ask to be deleted or, or rewarded or something. So two of you or three of you go through a process where you guys read it and you okay it. And if you okay it, it'll go ahead. And of course, implicitly, if something offensive to the government was published, you know, you know whose head could, you know who could be held responsible for this, okay? So peer review, in terms of its origins, was created as a system of censorship. It's not created as a, as a system of scientific fact-checking. Fact-checking is part of the editor's role, and fact-checking is very time-consuming, and today nobody wants to pay for it. And that's what you see in terms of the decline in the quality of journalism and everything else. I mean, sir, but just imagine, I used to do this for a living, but if I'm handed something, and it makes a bunch of complex claims about what was going on in the government of Vietnam in 1984, you know, it, it's very hard for me to sit there and say, okay, you know, is this person accurately reporting? Because I'm, I'm peer reviewing an article about, uh, sorry, I'm not peer reviewing, I'm editing, I'm editing an article about what was going on in Cambodian politics. And it briefly mentions a bunch of stuff about what was going on in Vietnamese politics, which is, of course, linked. I start checking into it and I'm like, look, this, this doesn't add up. Like, you know, where did you get this from? You got this from Breitbart News Agency. You got this from the Vietnamese equivalent of Breitbart or something. This doesn't match up with the basic facts. But here's the difference with real editing, right? Real editing is also a, a dialogue and a discourse. The, the peer review has none of that. Peer review is either it's approved or it's rejected. 
period. And that's because it developed this system censorship. What you really need is exactly to say, look, you know, and you can you can be polite, but you say, look, I like your article. There's some good things about it, but you have this one paragraph about what was happening in Vietnam in the early 1980s, and you know, th this doesn't check out for me. I mean, so what are your sources here, or what are you thinking, or could you rewrite this? Because I mean, in terms of the basic facts, I don't I don't see how this matches up the rest of the And they'll they write back to you, you know, and either they'll do it or they refuse. Either they back can back it up or they can't. That is the process of fact checking and editing. You have it has to be back and forth with the author. That's that's utterly lacking, right? Now, sorry, the, the final. I mean, I could I could give many examples just from my own life about how peer review works. As well. I have been a peer reviewer. I have no PhD. I have peer reviewed multiple articles, and I'm good at it. <laughs> you know, partly because I have this background in in, edit, in editing, partly because I'm incredibly cynical about what peer review is and what it ought to be. I had a situation in Cambodia where I wrote an article. It's still on the internet. Um, the article deals with racism, imperialism, mass murder. It's about, I mean, again, see, I was a scholar of Buddhism, but I dealt with, with real issues. And it de deals with even the origin of, of Nazi ideology in Buddhist studies. So the connection between Buddhist research and Aryan race theory and, and racism in, in Western Europe, which is fascinating. So there's a lot of really politically hard-hitting stuff here coming out of Buddhist studies. And you ask yourself, why is it you don't why is it you don't see hard-hitting stuff like that coming out of academia or Buddhist studies or Buddhist publications? It's because peer review is a system of censorship, right? And this article, okay. So this article, and it's and it's especially relevant to to Cambodia. And I was going to publish it in quite a humble publication that's based in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Now, I thought it would go ahead for a number of reasons. That publication, the reviewers are not Buddhist monks. I don't think they're they're Buddhist, period. They're a bunch of old white men with PhDs from France. I would guess all of them are French, maybe one or two are Australian, but the, the peer reviewers are probably all conservative white French scholars based in, in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Uh, so they get this essay, and the, the lead editor, the, the senior academic who's in charge, says right away, he reads it, he says, wow, this is brilliant, this is important, we're going we're gonna to publish it. Great. Months and months go past. I'm living in Cambodia this time. I'm busy with other things. And then I get back to them. And for me, the main reason to publish them was that they would, everything they published in that, in that publication, they published in both English and Cambodian. And I really wanted to reach the Cambodian. That's what I cared about, frankly, in a humanitarian way. I get back to them a couple months later and I say, okay, so what's, what's happening with the translation? Because, you know, I'm really, you know, what I really care about is the human. And he says, well, you know, it's complicated. And he says, if you want to speed up the process you could pay a translator. You could start working with the translator because I know, again, I'd have to talk. The translator would have questions. Okay, what do you mean in this passage? Because translating academic English into Cambodian is not easy. There'd be a lot of Q&A. He said, well, you can get started with the translator and up to so much money, we'll pay you back. Like, you know, we'll, this, this kind of thing. So he said, because we have a budget for translation, but it's probably better if you want to speed it up. So that's how certain he was. He was going to publish the thing. I start talking to translators. Months go past. And he breaks down and admits to me the reality of the situation. He kept presenting it to peer reviewers. They kept rejecting it for purely nationalistic reasons. My essay was insulting to the memory of the French Empire. <laughs> this, is, this is in the 21st century. This is in the 21st century. Right when you think anti-imperialism and sort of left-wing white guilt is like this, you know. It's like, yeah. um, so again, I thought, okay, I thought I had a secular Western non-religious. I thought because I knew this would not get published by a Buddhist studies conservative Buddhist studies. This was too insulting to the memory of what they thought of as the greatness of the French Empire in Cambodia and Vietnam, because France conquered Cambodia and Vietnam, et cetera, you know, it worked out great. Have you heard of the Vietnam War? It's kind of like the, the appendix to that disaster, <laughs> right? Okay, and so what he kept doing, he kept giving it to a scholar, and they'd reject it, and then he would crumple up the record that he'd given it to a peer reviewer, because, you know, like, it's supposed to be you just give it to two peer reviewers, and if they both say no, it's rejected, right? And he would pretend he hadn't done that, and he would try with another scholar, try with another scholar, try, and he tried with the whole college. So whatever. Again, most most of these probably maybe they have ten people with PhDs, maybe fewer, maybe six or something, right? And every single one of them rejected it out of pure political bias, not even religious bias. 
right? And th this shows many things about the proofers. Because this guy, the one doing the review, his name is Michel Antelme. He's at Inalco in France. He's a major scholar in his field. He's probably the number one scholar on Cambodia. He recognized the merit and importance of my article. So why can't he go ahead and publish it? Why can't, or why, even if there are problems with it, why can't he start engaging with me as an editor? Because it's fine. He can challenge me the same way I've been describing an editor challenging someone. He could go through and say, okay, well, in this paragraph, uh, where are you coming from? Or how do you back this up? Fine. I'm all for it. That's scrutiny. What the process needs is scrutiny. But peer review is not scrutiny. And again, even this joke example, it's a real example of the Star Wars science fiction bullshit being published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. It shows peer review is not a system of scrutiny. It's not a system of, of content-driven editorship. It's not a system of scrutiny. It is just a system of censorship. I've seen this again and again in my life. I saw it when I was doing uh, work on social conditions in Cambodia. I saw complete fiction published in The Lancet. The Lancet. The Lancet is the single most reviewed, single most revered peer-reviewed journal in medicine. And I was going through their stuff on Cambodia that was linked to the research I was doing, social science research. You know, in Cambodia, my research involved AIDS and a lot of other social problems and the medical care system. And I was finding stuff, just like the, the article about uh, Star Wars, things that I could prove were false just by taking them and Googling them. We think, oh, that doesn't sound right. Let me Google it. Let me check these couple of reports that have been asked. And it's wrong. Because nobody's doing that. Sorry. So, guys, that's, that's my conclusion here. Peer review is not a system of scrutiny. It's a system of censorship. It's not the scientific method. It's not even the Writer's Guild method of how to revise a script. I know people believe in peer review as the difference between light and darkness, between what's legitimate and what's illegitimate. What I'm inviting you to imagine here is that Buddhist studies is not so unique. The important research, the important message, the important findings I had to share in, in Buddhist studies were impossible to publish in Buddhist studies today in the 21st century. And it's worth noting that field was way more open to new ideas, new discoveries in the 19th century. This is true even about, about First Nation studies. I'm sorry, it's one, one more example, but these, each one of these examples is really important to me. So, you know, Buddhist studies in the 19th century, soldiers with no PhD and no formal education who were deployed in the British Empire would dabble in archaeology and research on Buddhism, and they would send in as letters to what are now peer-reviewed journals, to academic journals, their findings, and they, they found brilliant and important stuff. And I think one reason for that was that a lot of the soldiers had good translators. They probably had the best translators in the British Empire. So they'd be going out and they'd be looking at ruins and they'd be saying, well, some of the villagers say this ruin used to be this, but we excavated and we found that, or we talked to, we talked to some Buddhist monks over here and they told us this and that. You had incredibly valuable findings being published, again, without peer review, sent in as handwritten letters from soldiers on the on the outermost parts of the British Empire. But it was really important, vital stuff that was getting published. There was a hypothesis. I mentioned this to my girlfriend recently. We were talking about Korean Ojibwe. We still look at the possibility of studying First Nations languages here in this apartment in this relationship. We're talking about whether or not we could go back and study uh, Cree, Ojibwe, Algonquian languages, that languages indigenous to Canada. Um, there was this hypothesis that was published many, many decades ago. I'm sorry, I think it was the 1970s. And today it wouldn't be published because it was it was just a hypothesis. It was a hypothesis in the purest sense of the word. This guy looked at the linguistic data for all the native peoples in North America and South America, the whole mega continent, North and South America, and the Caribbean. And he drew lines in a map and he said, hey, look, I don't really have any evidence, but based on comparative study of these languages, this is my theory of how uh, how the actual migration took place when these people first settled North and South America. All right, 40 years later or something, DNA research, bang, confirms that his hypothesis was right on. It's such an important article, but it, it was just a hypothesis. It was just speculation. And that's exactly what peer review excludes. Now, again, sorry, all the problems you have with Wikipedia are infinitely worse with peer review. They're worse both positively and negatively. They're worse in terms of what they will publish 
They're worse in terms of what they exclude. They're worse because they utterly lack the back and forth of challenging the person. Say, well, do you have a source on this? Can you improve this? Can you rewrite this? It's a single stage process. And exactly the areas where Wikipedia is impossible to trust, like politics, like religion, but some of these examples I'm giving are, are hard sciences even. Um, linguistics, you know, physics and chemistry and what have you. Um, in exactly those same areas where Wikipedia is unreliable, peer review itself is worse than useless. Guys, if you watched this video, thank you for spending the time with me. Um, <laughs> any last thoughts, babe? What is civilization? Is civilization the aggregate sum of our traditions, our you know, cultural assumptions, our beliefs, our, uh, our, our folklore and our national characteristics, or is it scientific progress? Um, well, one of the fundamental problems of scientific progress is that it is elite, it is elitist, it's something the vast majority of us can't participate in in any meaningful way. And peer review, I think, is a, another example of one of these aspects of academia, whether it's in the sciences or the arts or what have you, <laughs> you know, anything, anything to do with academia, where it's, it's remained behind the curtain. It's remained behind a veil of inscrutability. It's been glorified and glamorized in many people's minds just because it's, it's just slightly out of sight. And I think that will change for one reason. And that one reason is what's now called surveillance. So surveillance is the opposite of surveillance. When I first went to Cambridge University, England, they were just experimenting with taking professors' lectures and dumping them on YouTube, basically dumping them on the internet. And I mean, one of them was a famous, famous left-wing professor giving a lecture on Marxism. He'd probably given the same lecture for 20 years. And you know, it sounds impressive. Oh, this great professor, he has a PhD, he has peer-reviewed articles, um, and you know, lecturing at this incredibly elite, incredibly expensive, incredibly hard to get into university. And the lectures were garbage. Surveillance changes everything. Um, there's a Facebook project called Film Your Marxist Professors. So far, it's it's garbage. They're not doing anything. They're not. But but the concept of that is very powerful. We all know if you've been to university, you know what it's like to be in the classroom with a professor who's saying something so crazy and so stupid, or so ill-informed and so ignorant that you can't believe it's being said in the classroom, and you're powerless to challenge it because there's an absolute unequal relationship of authority. Well, now, as never before, you can film that, and you can put it on YouTube. And this will challenge academia in a way that it has never been challenged before. The power of surveillance, the power of film your Marxist professors, you know, it, to shake academics out of, because most of those professors are saying crazy, dumb things. It's because for the last 20 years, they dug down into a narrower and narrower little trench. They're just within radical left-wing women's studies. Or indeed, the Buddhist professors, they're within this little narrow trench where nobody challenges how insane their ideas about Buddhism are. Not even other Buddhists. They don't even hear it from mainstream Buddhism or something. They're working within this. Within politics, but even within the sciences. There are lots, when you talk to people in the STEM fields, there are a lot of horror stories about, about awful professors in science. I think what is ultimately going to change peer review in academia itself is the camera, the miniature camera, the culture of the internet, YouTube. I think surveillance is going to mark a line in the sand between the past and the future of what we do in higher learning. And, um, and then and only then will freedom of speech come to academia and maybe we can see a fundamental reform in the way peer review and the progress of human knowledge and inquiry works. Da -da 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 -da.